Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome to this Peak Prosperity Podcast. I am your host, Chris Martinson. You know what? It's easy to become overwhelmed, frustrated, uh, disappointed with the direction the world is heading. But where are the glimmers of hope? What is there to cheer for in this story? Now, in our work at Peak Prosperity, we are always on the lookout for solutions and rays of hope where they exist. And one place we increasingly find a lot of hope are when we see the incredible things people are doing to farm regeneratively and profitably, as is the case for Farmland LP on the large size and Singing Frogs Farm on the small side of things. But what about people who live in urban or suburban areas? Is there anything an urban person can do besides grow a few herbs on a pot on the upper balcony? Well, it turns out there is, and that a lot of our future hope for living more equitably and regeneratively is going to require that we put our cityscapes towards new and improved uses. How do I know there's a lot we can do? Because I just read Toby Hemingway's new book, The Permaculture City, Regenerative Design for Urban, Suburban, and Town Resilience. Here to talk about his new book and to share his learnings and ideas with us is Toby Hemingway, the author also of Gaia's Garden, A Guide to Home-Scale Permaculture, which happens to be the best-selling book on permaculture in the world. Toby, welcome to the show. Hey, Chris. It's great to be here. Oh, it's so good to talk to you again. You know, I just saw you a few weeks ago out there in uh, Sebastopol, California, and uh, we did take a tour of said Singing Frogs Farm. That was a pretty amazing demonstration to me of what's possible biologically, ecologically, permaculturally, and economically. It, it sure was. I was so inspired by, by what Paul and Elizabeth Kaiser are doing out there. And you listed just all the, all the different kind of boxes that it checks. And that's, that's really what that work does. I mean, it sequesters carbon. It, it pays enough money to pay their workers well. You know, it, it cleans up the water and it generates incredibly healthy food. You can't ask for much more than that. Now, this brings us, you know, I really want to just dive right into your book um, because everybody would love to do that, but not everybody can live on an eight acre spread in, in uh, Sebastopol. So um, let's start there. Why did you write this book? Right. Well, I had been living in Seattle for a number of years uh, working in biotech and uh, got kind of discouraged with the direction biotech was going. And my wife was discouraged with her work as well. And we decided to uh, do the back to the land thing. And we moved down to southern Oregon and bought 10 acres and, and really did the back to the land thing. But one of the things I really noticed was suddenly I was driving everywhere. I mean, I was burning probably five times, 10 times more gas in the country than I was in the city. Uh, we were just using far more resources. Our, our driveway was a quarter mile long and required graveling pretty much every year because of the winter rains. When a neighbor got cable TV, it was a quarter mile of, of wire just to hook up that one house. Our well was on the end of a half mile of pipe. And after 10 years there, we did have a wonderful time, but we decided to go back to the city. And suddenly I noticed my resource use shrank again drastically. My electric bill went down, the car I hardly needed to drive. And uh, I, I started thinking, well, so maybe city living is actually something that could be relatively sustainable, that, that we could actually have fairly small ecological footprints in the city uh, as compared to at least the way country life is these days in the United States. I mean, country life can have a small footprint, but not as it's presently constituted in the U.S. So it really got me interested in the possibilities for living more sustainably in urban areas. And that was, that was really the gener genesis of the book, was discovering all these cool projects and just the possibilities of the, the richness and abundance in urban and suburban and also small town life. Well, great. So before we get into the specifics of those things, I'm interested... How has permaculture developed over the past decade? I know we're seeing lots and lots of um, improvements in technology, but I assume systems thinking has gone through iterations. People have tried things, failed at them, discovered what works, what doesn't work. What, what's, what's really been advancing that you've been seeing? Yeah, there, there have been advances on several fronts. And, and one is that we're starting to get good data now. There were a lot of 
um, claims made in permaculture that were based on more theory in the early days, 20, 25 years ago. You know, we thought this should work. It's a great idea. Mm -hmm. and, and people would sometimes talk as if it had worked when we really didn't have good data. And now, now we know a lot more about what does work. Uh, we've kind of toned down some of the rhetoric. We're, we're uh, you know, really trying to be more fact-based. But another one of the, the huge developments is the big understanding that what we've learned in the garden, what we've learned in growing food, uh, when you design ecologically sound systems for food, you learn the same principles and the same guidelines for designing pretty much anything else using whole systems thinking. So we've learned that we can design energy systems, water systems, and even social systems and, and communities and, and even perhaps economic systems uh, using permaculture design because it's based on how whole systems work. It's based on natural system design. So that's been one of the biggest uh, changes and bits of growth in permaculture is kind of moving out of the garden and into the rest of the human world and all the things that we need to be working on. Well, sure. And most of the human world lives in cities or something close to a city at this point in time. So um, let's just start right at the outside of that. Uh, uh, why do we need permaculture in cities? And, and second, uh, is that even possible? Right. Well, yeah, I mean, over 50% of the world's population right now lives in cities. And if you include the suburbs, just the whole metropolitan areas, it's closer to 70%. So obviously, if we're going to try to become a more sustainable society, that population and, and the behaviors that are going on there are the ones that really need to change uh, and really need to be improved. So it's a leverage point. It's really the place that you really need to be working. So there, there are, of course, specific challenges to working in urban areas. And, and I, I do think that, that there's so much that can be done, particularly now that we know that permaculture and, and ecological design in general is not just about going out and buying a piece of land somewhere and growing a lot of your own food, that it's, it's got a lot to do with the kind of food system that you support, whether you're growing it your, on your own yourself or not. But what kind of food system do you want to be spending your money on? What kind of food system do you want to encourage? What kind of political process? What kind of social processes? So those are the things that are most exciting about urban permaculture these days is, is really getting, getting people behind it in, in large numbers. So cities are the leverage point for that. Well, great. So uh, give us an example. Where is this happening and, and what does it actually look like? Right. <clears throat> well, as I was doing research for the book, it was kind of funny because whenever I would Google something or talk to someone about, you know, where are some really good examples of, say, uh, raising small scale livestock in urban areas or even things like who's doing innovative work in developing uh, good social justice systems? And there was a series of cities that just kept coming up all the time. It was uh, Portland, Oregon, Oakland, California, Detroit. Pittsburgh and Jamaica Plain uh, in the Boston area were the ones that came up the most often. Then, of course, there were a number of others, but it just seemed like so many of the examples were in places like that. And I kind of came up with a theory that there are places like, like Oakland that are very, very dense uh, and have really the, the, their share of big city urban problems. Uh, all the things that you would associate with, you know, very highly populated, ethnically diverse, uh, a lot of poverty, these sorts of things. Uh, so there are cities, and, and then Detroit and Pittsburgh are places that, you know, are, have, have kind of almost collapsed in the last few decades. So there are cities that need solutions like that, that are just, they're desperate. They've got to work out problems. So they're open to innovations and new ideas that perhaps a lot of other cities wouldn't be open to. And then places like Portland, uh, are places that have always been kind of experimental and open to new ideas, and they're full of young people who are bringing a lot of vigor and, and interest and curiosity. So those those were the types of places where lots and lots of going on is going on. Although there, are, I don't mean to exclude other cities. There's lots of cool stuff happening almost everywhere. Miami, New York City, you know, you name it. Um, oh, Brooklyn was one of the other ones that kept coming up as well. But it helps to be young or desperate. <laughs> right. Those seem to be the two places, uh, the two kind of populations that people 
really were were looking for new ideas and really embracing um, permacultural and and other whole system design methods. Well, let's talk about then um, what some of these things might be. So, what could what are the sorts of things? Uh, that a person who has an urban home garden really do. I, I mean, let, let's start with somebody who's got a, just a tiny plot of land. What's what's possible? Right. Well, a, a lot of it is getting the best use out of that small space. So one of the things that permaculture really specializes in is multifunctional plants. In other words, if you're going to plant a tree, you don't just plant a shade tree that's only going to give you shade. You think about the fact that it can give you shade. It can provide habitat. You can probably get some kind of food off of it. And also the leaves can become leaf litter to break down into soil and all kinds of, you know, it'll be a windbreak for you. So we design really strategically by thinking of all the possible functions that any one plant can have and then try to locate it in a place where you can take advantage of all those functions. Like, you know, if you're living in a particularly cold, windy climate, then designing for creating a warmer microclimate through your plantings or just the opposite. If you're in a place like Phoenix, you're going to want to design to cool things off and shade things and, and create lovely places to be out. Side. So part of it is just getting the most use out of plants, and, and permaculture has, has enormous plant lists of, of plants that serve so many different functions. So one plant will build soil, attract beneficial insects, and provide you with a food crop, and maybe even provide you with some sort of textile fiber as well, or something like that. Hmm. So that's one really important piece uh, of making the absolute most of a small space, is getting those multifunctional plants in. Now, I know you have a lot of, of ideas and examples in your book. Um, and what I'm wondering, though, for the person listening, are, are they going to find in this book um, a, a list of things they might try? Or is it really a, a set of ideas that then they have to bring to their specific situation? What I tried to do in this book was it, it is a little bit more of an ideas book than, than Gaia's Garden was. It's really about how to think about these things. Because what I want to do is give people a set of problem-solving tools and then because so often many of these solutions are really specific to a particular place. You know, someone who's living in Atlanta is going to come up with very different solutions than someone living in Minneapolis or that sort of thing. So although there are very specific examples and a lot of techniques given in the book, those are really there to stimulate people's thinking and to give examples of the solutions people have come up with. And and just to, you know, to not to try and sell my other book, but what I tried to do was not have very much overlap so that people could go back to Gaia's garden for the specific methods, the more detailed how-to, the big long plant lists and all of that sort of thing. And they can learn how to think about these things by reading the Permaculture City. Sure, of course. And and, and what I'm seeing here in, in this book is not um, permaculture. When I hear the word, sometimes I think, oh, this is about a, a, a really lush, maybe a little bit wild, untamed looking garden uh, and, and uh, things like that. But you're talking about whole systems thinking. So you include things like uh, water in here and and how to deal with that, right? Right. And water is such a huge issue these days. I mean, of course, certainly in, in the, the Western U.S., uh, but also even even in the East where they're having enormous rainstorms and, you know, crazy weather conditions like that. So looking at how cities get their water, looking at how your individual actions can can do things like save water, but also how can we reduce the stress on our city's water infrastructure, the whole water and sewer system, so that we're not spending lots of money on taxes to repair all these things and have giant projects going on all the time. So part of part of the, the water chapter in the book really is how can we be wiser both in the way we use water and we dispose of it so that, that, so that we just don't have to do these big infrastructure projects quite as much as we've had to in the past. Well, yeah, sure. And, and uh, uh, I think it takes a, a shift in the narrative a bit, too. So when I was growing up, water was free, you know, it was everywhere. It was so, you know, practically free, really low cost. Um, and, and of course, now people are starting to adjust their opinion to that, not least of which is people will spend more for a bottle of water than than equivalent amount of gasoline uh, in the store. You know, so so I think our views of water have changed. But you're talking about um, really starting to rethink water, which some places have using gray water is an idea, I guess. Um, some places still don't allow that. But, um, you know, go go into like I thought you had some just really fascinating um, uh, ideas in there around gray water in particular. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the largest single use of water for most people is out in the landscape, is, is irrigation. Um, even places that get adequate rainfall, you're still going to be irrigating a fair amount. And so part of what you, you need to be thinking about is how do you, again, get the most use out of your water? And gray water, which is water from the laundry or the shower, is, is it's not potable, but it's not sewage either. It's only got a little bit of dirt in it, a little bit of soap. So it's, it's not unsanitary at all as long as you get it on the ground in a, within a, about 48 hours. So this is, to me, this is free irrigation water. You're already using the water. You're doing a load of laundry. You're taking a shower. And so why not, instead of just piping that water away, and it, it's barely dirty, it's, it's clean enough to water plants. Plants actually love gray water because it, it does have a few things in it. I mean, the dirt and soap in, in gray water is easily converted by soil organisms into nutrients for plants. So you're not only watering your plants, but you're giving them a little bit of fertility. So to me, that's absolutely guilt-free irrigation water because you're using it already, and that way you not only save save on your water bill by not having to buy more water, but you're also reducing the stress on the city's infrastructure by not just dumping it all down the sewer where you know it has to be dealt with and purified again. So practically, if somebody already has all of their gray and black water mixed together and it's going out into a sewage system, how would they, what's involved to uh, separate those? Right. Well, an easy way to do that is just hook right up to your washing machine. Well, you know, most people do have a washing machine and it's got a pump built right into it. And that pump is actually certified to be able to pump 10 feet vertically. That's, uh, that's what they insist on um, so that the pump doesn't burn out if you uh, happen to be you know, doing your laundry in a basement or something. So what that will do is it'll blow the water way out into your yard. You can hook up a pipe and there are very easy instructions. It's called laundry to landscape gray water uh, on how to just hook up very, very simple plumbing to the outlet from your washing machine. And then you don't have to worry about gravity. I mean, you can't pump uphill terribly far, but you can pump way out to the back of your yard. You could pump even a couple hundred feet uh, from where your washing machine is if, you're, if, you know, if the stuff you want to water is, is a distance away. So that's a really simple way where you don't even have to cut into your plumbing or anything like that. The washing machine is, is kind of the, the quickest and easiest leverage point to start with. And because there's a pump, it'll deliver the water right to where you need it. Well, that, that does sound easy. In fact, I could do that in my house. That you could, and many people do, that's for sure. There have been thousands and thousands of gray water conversions just in my county alone. Really? Well, yeah, I guess and uh, that certainly makes sense given the, what's going on out west this year. Um, well, it, it then similarly, uh, but switching, talking about energy. You know, we talk about energy a lot at Peak Prosperity. We're of the view that someday fossil fuels will run out. Uh, and that will either because of uh, economically we've gone after the dregs to the point of exhaustion or we decide it's a bad idea to keep burning these. But one way or the other, we're going to be done with those. And that's a, an area that I happen to feel um, our country is particularly ill-suited for because we still... As Jim Kunstler says, you know, we're, we're still largely a, a happy motoring nation, right? You know, we're still largely set up, and this mirrors your experience of moving from the country back towards the city and, and discovering you didn't need your car as much, right, and all of that. But we're still heavily, heavily dependent on on our vehicles. How does, and, and also our homes, uh, use an incredible amount of energy. How does your book begin to tackle those ideas? Right, well, again, I try and give people some thinking tools, just how do we think about energy? How can we... Kind of change our thinking because you're you're right. I mean, we we are we still don't think very wisely, uh, both as a as a nation from the the gov the federal level uh, all the way down to individuals. We're not really thinking very wisely about about fossil fuels and energy use. So I I start out by giving uh, people several different tools for thinking about energy about figuring out what the most efficient use of an energy source is. You know, there's some things that gasoline is absolutely fantastic for. I mean, it's, it's a liquid, it's easily transportable, it's incredibly energy dense. It's, to me, it's one of the most valuable substances on earth. And so just setting it on fire the way we do so much seems like a crazy thing to do. But there are a number of tasks that gasoline is beautifully suited to do. And then there are others that electricity is more appropriate for. And there are others that, that other types of fuels are more appropriate or energy sources are more appropriate for. So 
what I'm trying to do is to give people the set of tools so that they can make wiser choices about what kinds of energy they should be using uh, and when they should be using it. Okay. Do you have an example for us? Uh, yeah, I'm looking. There, there's a really wonderful example <clears throat> uh, that actually was thought up by um, Amory Lovins, who talks about he calls it cutting butter with a chainsaw, where you're you're using a type of fuel that say generates an incredibly high temperature process when all you want is really a fairly low temperature kind of heat. Uh, for example, your the furnace in most people ho houses generates a flame inside that's 1200 or 1400 degrees or so and all you're wanting to do is warm your house from say 62 degrees up to 68 degrees. So it's it's a little bit crazy to be running a giant burner at you know, 1500 degrees when all you want is a few degrees of temperature change. So this is where something like uh, passive solar heating makes way more sense. Just use the already existing warmth in the sun or the uh, in-ground geothermal systems that they're starting to develop where you run some pipes uh, into the ground a few feet deep to take advantage of the fact that the ground is pretty much always at a, at a steady temperature and you can actually pull the heat out of the ground and transfer it into your house. So just ways of of not doing crazy things with energy where you're g generating an enormous amount of energy to do a very low energy or low quality task like just warming something up. Well, yeah, that's uh, it brings us to an interesting point, which is you know one of the things I'm fond of saying is that um, we have a lot of um, of uh, technology and ideas about how to do things that are that are. Um, that are just sitting there. We're not really using them yet. Part of the frustration I have, because I'm I, I'm a big believer in rational thought and all that, which is like if something <laughs> works better, we should do that, right? But it's it's amazing. I mean, you know, a, a, a child of mine went into the ER the other day and, and and with a with a pretty decent cut, and and they said, oh well, here just have her start. You know, we're gonna uh, you know just start scrubbing it out with betadine. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa! Ten years ago, they learned that betadine is bad on wounds. It it really inhibits wound healing. There's a lot of no, we have no people haven't been doing that for a decade. You know, uh, and it still hasn't penetrated my local hospital, um, you know, their, their best in practice is, is like woefully behind a, a two minute Google search, you know, and um, uh, th I run into that a lot. So I'm wondering, as you're out researching this book, grabbing all this wonderful data, how much are you running into this idea that that there's just some really low hanging fruit out there that we could just tackle right away? maybe even save money, have higher quality of life? I mean, just how much low-hanging fruit is there? Or, or, or are we already to the point where we're going to have to get down to some really big, hairy uh, you know, predicament solving? No, I think there is a tremendous amount of low-hanging fruit because we've, we've had this wonderful opportunity of incredibly cheap fuel. So we've, we've been able to be really, really lazy about, about energy, about water, about all these resources where they've just been so abundant and so cheap that we haven't had to give anything a second thought. And yet there are things like just passive solar heating, for example, that the sun provides warmth very easily and you can just paint something dark and warm it up a lot better. So there, there are so many things like that, a particular, particularly a water heating systems would be a perfect way to use the warmth of the sun to heat up water instead of propane or, or you know, an even worse case is using electricity to generate heat. You, you take this incredibly delicate, beautiful, highly refined source of energy that electricity is that takes hugely technological processes to generate and then you just convert it into heat, which really is the, the lowest form of energy, uh, just in terms of its ability to do work. And, and so using electricity to generate heat is a crazy thing to do, and yet it's one of our major heat sources. While the sun is out there ready to heat your water up really easily, even in cold climates, we have very simple technology for doing solar hot water collection. So that's there are all kinds of places like that where just in your betadine example, we just haven't changed our thinking. We haven't paid attention to what the new developments are and we're still stuck in an old paradigm when the paradigm is very rapidly shifting in front of us. Yeah, and and uh, it really appears like um, uh, there, there's some resistance to sometimes to doing things the right way. And sometimes it's, it's, a, it's a little odd, a little bizarre. You know, people write in all the time and they go, yeah, my town won't even let me have chickens. You know, that's not even a rooster versus hen thing. It's just no chickens or um, you know, they are forbidden from actually putting anything but grass in or, you know, whatever. So we have, we have, 
a lot of people clinging to sort of this idea of what a what can and can't be done on on your <clears throat> air quotes private property and all of that. But uh, but those those seem to be shifting now, particularly uh, with the with the younger people and the pain points. I I guess Detroit's about ready to try anything. Chickens are good, huh? Right, right. And I, I think that that's, that's some, a part of, I don't know if it's human nature or our culture, you know, I would like to think that we're smart enough to be able to look into the future and say, you know, this is coming our way, this is inevitable, it's it may be five or 20 years off, but we should start preparing for it now, things like climate change or energy descent or all these pretty big deals, but it just seems like we're not wired to uh, to adjust to those sorts of things and so it, it unfortunately seems like it does take some sort of a crisis or a big wake-up call or disaster or something like that to get us to change so part of you know my efforts and and well many other people's yours as well is is to try to not only send that wake-up call but offer a set of tools to begin doing something about it and to point out to people that it's actually going to be fun to do this i think part of the hesitancy is that people are worried about you know well solar collectors that's you know that that's a, a lessening of my lifestyle when it when it's really not to me it's a you know it, it's an improvement in your lifestyle so i think part of it is just getting the message across it this is not going to be putting on a sweater and living in a cold room or tight tightening your belt it's actually going to be more fun sexier more interesting and and we can paint a picture of it as such and get people to adopt these things before the crisis comes at least that's certainly my hope well absolutely and and uh Let's talk about um, uh, one audience that that feels usually feels most boxed in by this. This is somebody who's living in an apartment of some kind, has no land of their own, maybe doesn't even have a balcony that faces south or a, another useful direction. Uh, what what is there for them to do in this story? Right, and that's something that I really try to address in the book is is for people who don't have any land at all and they want to be. Uh, either getting access to much healthier food or even growing some of it themselves, or even that they want to be making a difference uh, socially and ecologically. So some of the, the tools there are just looking at how do we get access to land if we don't own land. And there, there's, it actually turns out that when people set up websites that try to connect people who want land to garden with people who have land to garden in cities, there is almost always more people offering land to garden than there are people looking for land. So people like uh, like the elderly, who, pe who perhaps love to garden, but perhaps they're just beyond the age where they can really do the physical work of gardening, are a, a really prime candidate for places to be able to help out and, and grow food. Uh, and then you build some really nice social relationships as well. So that's, that's one place. Uh, there's actually a really wonderful example from Barcelona that I just heard of where a group of permaculturists had taken over a couple of old factory buildings that didn't really have any land around them. So they went over to a couple of senior centers um, right across the street and the seniors were really happy to have these young people gardening for them. And then when the police came to uh, evict these squatters, these seniors formed a big ring around the building and said, no way, these people are providing our food. And the police realized, well, we don't exactly want to beat somebody's old grandmother, so we're just going to go away. So those are the sorts of social bonds that you can build um, through this kind of community garden programs as well. Well, that, that's a, a very interesting story, and and I know that there. Are, this is one of the great divides that you know surfaced even when uh, Adam and I were out in uh, Sebastopol with Rob Wolf, yourself, talk, giving a talk. You know, it's clear it's right in the audience. There were young people who I define under as under thirty. They're putting their hands up, going, "Look, we don't have capital. What do we do?" And then there are older people going, "We do, but we don't know how to put this all together." Um, how do these besides a website that sort of gets them coming together? I mean, there is a lot to think about in how you begin to to um, share capital, as it were, particularly in a in a society that has been hyper individualistic, has really formed a culture around mine versus yours, uh, all of that stuff, and that we value financial capital very differently than we do other forms of capital. How, how is it that that uh, what, what does permaculture begin to offer us about ways to um, maybe begin redesigning ourselves? Right. We really need structures in place that, that help us make these kind of decisions because you're right, we're very individualistic in the whole idea of sharing. I mean, it seems like a really nice idea that an older person who 
you know, owns a place that, that is probably quite expensive now with real estate being what it is. And, a, you know, getting together with a younger person who's got more energy and, and you know, maybe can do all the, the heavy work around the place. Um, that, that sounds like a great idea, but right, how do you structure it? And this is, again, one of the places that I think permaculture has a real advantage in that perm permaculture really at its heart is a set of decision-making tools. That, that we've spent a long time working out a, a set of methods that help us arrive at the right solutions. We have all these methods available to us, all these techniques for, say, um, making decisions in groups or organizing entities like nonprofits and businesses. We've got so many ways of doing this. And what permaculture does is it helps us work our way through the thicket of all these possibilities and arrive at, rather than impose, actually arrive at solutions that make sense for the circumstances involved. So that's another thing that I, I work on quite a bit in the book is what kind of decision-making processes are going to be most appropriate for various solutions? How can we learn to work to better, together better? Because I think that if, if the problems of the world were primarily technological, we'd have them all solved. But the problems of the world are political and social, and those are just vastly more intractable and, intractable and very challenging for us. Oh, indeed they are. And... Uh... But, but again, I can feel that sense of urgency is, is building more and more, you know, as our larger narrative begins to shred, however people get that news, whether they need to see a falling stock market or they read about the 10th dead whale floating up on California's shores. It's just clear that, that the systems that, um, that have been sold to us as, as being progress, as being, you know, the, the right way forward, that it's increasingly becoming clear that each technological solution is really just a band-aid for the problems created by the last technological solution, you know, and so we just keep going down that path and more and more people become disillusioned by it. And we get to the punchline, which is, oh, by the way, it turns out we don't actually really enjoy our lives all that much uh, in many cases, you know, um, when we buy into the dominant narrative. So permaculture to me feels a little a little anarchistic, a little breaking from the social. There's a little social deviation from it, which means, you know, we're, we're going to do things differently and think about things differently than we have for the past hundred years in this in this uh, in this culture in the United States. Pro, you know, I, I would I'd put most of Western culture in this. Probably China's too. You know, so we have to think about things fundamentally differently. Um, is how how does how does your how do you how do you deal with with that idea that that really this isn't so much necessarily for a lot of people a case of learning superior system design techniques as much as it is dismantling. Um, old belief systems that are no longer enabling us, right? And that's that's really the truth. That it's it it is the idea of of dismantling these these older ideas. You know, one of the the things that that I think is has that we have a lot to benefit from is the fact that there was a lot of social experimentation that was done in the nineteen sixties and nineteen seventies, and at, in those days. A, a lot of the young people working with this just kind of threw out everything and said all of the old ways of doing things are bad and we're going to start from scratch. And in in many cases, it didn't go very well. Uh, they, you know, the, the communes are not around anymore for the most part and these sorts of things. But in the ensuing 30 years or so, a, a lot of people stuck with it, that there were a lot of experimental communities, there were a lot of, a, a, a lot of, there was a lot of work done in how can we create alternative currencies, alternative economic models, alternative social models. So there actually is a very sophisticated body of knowledge now that we've gained over the last 40 or 50 years in terms of decision making in groups, in terms of group process, in terms of how to structure even things like businesses and nonprofits. And so we, we actually do have a, a very large toolkit uh, to take advantage of. And, and I, I, again, try and point people towards some of those in the, in the book. That there were, we, there are actually really viable alternatives. They're just not out there in the mainstream yet. But with a little bit of digging, uh, you can find that there are ways to um, structure communities, help structure neighborhoods. Say, you know, if if you want to work work out some sorts of agreements with your neighbors, there are very good tools for doing that that have already been worked out. That that we already know. Uh, you know what the the negative and positives are, and that they're they're kind of tried and true at this point. 
Well, I tell you, we have to do something. And um, uh, just, you know, I, every time I talk with somebody who's my age, I'm, I'm, I'm 53 now. And, and uh, uh, if they spend any time at all outdoors, we, we all have these like litany of horrors of things that have, that have happened to the natural world in our lifetimes. And, and it's so amazingly quick. But somebody who's, who's young today, I'll say, you know, under the age of 20, won't know what I'm talking about when I say that when we used to drive, um, we went, drove about 300 miles for our summer vacation. And we'd have to stop for gas twice, you know, in a big old station wagon. And we'd always have to clean off the windshield because it's just splattered with, blood, with bugs, right? And I remember that. It was just, that was, that was part of summer. Uh, now I can drive 1,000 miles and not even have a single thing to clean off my windshield. And that's true all over the country now. And so the idea that we've lost... Insects is something that um, once upon a time, I don't think anybody would have cared. But now I have that little pit in my stomach that says, oh, this is this is not good. Um, you know, there, there's such uh, a, a richness that, you know, the insects are, are so important in, in the overall food chain and all the services they provide. And we only think about them as, as having negative services, but it's not true. So there's really a large reorientation of our relationship to each other and the natural world in just from a thinking standpoint like let's start here we need insects that'd be a pretty big idea to insert in some people's brains right there are things like that because i mean i remember being in a hardware store a few years ago and i someone came in and said what can i use to kill all the bugs in my garden and just getting that you know that paradigm that bugs are bad and it turns out that only about five percent of all the insects are actually harmful to to our crops or ourselves and the other 95 percent are either beneficial or or neutral so and and you're right they are they're a critical element pretty low down on the food chain um, you know they're a really important food source for birds and reptiles and, and a lot of mammals and and you're right i just took a long drive and i noticed wow i've only got like two bugs on my windshield after driving 500 miles even around twilight which is when the bugs usually come out so Again, just thinking in terms of biodiversity is what can we be doing to provide habitat for all these creatures since we've we've removed so much of it so so drastically. I mean, this is where again this idea of multifunctional plantings come in. That that when we do plant things, think about the insects, think about the birds. You know, I I love designing a garden and coming back and finding it is just humming with insects because then I know that there are going to be birds there feeding on those insects. There are going to be you know, all kinds of, of other wildlife that's being supported by the, the low end of the food chain like that. Absolutely. And that was uh, one of the instructive lessons, again, from Paul and Elizabeth Kaiser at Singing Frogs, where they had these hedgerows with very diverse things. And it wasn't like a hedgerow of boxwood. You know, they, they had at least 12 species that I could see in any one hedgerow. And those hedgerows were there to break the wind and do the usual things, but to provide habitat for the for the predator class and other classes of insects that are longer living because as predators, they, they breed more slowly and all of that. So they created habitat for the kind of insects they wanted. And as a result, they had very, very low insect pressure in their main garden. I couldn't believe they didn't spray or anything. I, I you know, I'm a longtime gardener. I'm looking at their brassicas. I'm like, where are all the holes in the leaves? You know, where are the cabbage loopers like daintily flying around all of everything, you know, and uh, didn't see it. So, so it, it's testament that it really, it can, it can work. And so to flip over to the positive side of this, that's what I love about what we're starting to see are these examples and stories of how all of this not only theoretically could work, but actually does again and ticks off all those categories. You know, it works ecologically, it works environmentally, socially, financially. It really makes a lot of sense. So um, I just think it's great that that you are uh, collecting all of these these ideas and ways of thinking into these books and uh, sharing them because uh, they're they're really fantastic to have uh, thought through. And you're a wonderful writer, so uh, it's all very well done. Oh, well, thank, thanks very much. Yeah, that I, I was certainly inspired by going to Paul's place, and it, it brought out to me the importance of good design, because one of the things, as I began studying permaculture years ago, one of the things that I started thinking, and I didn't even really want to have this thought, was, wow, you know, through good design, we might even be able to do better than nature. And that just, mm. that I, I was struck by that, because, boy, there's a lot of hubris involved in a statement like that. But when, when Paul Kaiser at Singing Frogs pointed out that his bird diversity was double what a nearby area of native plants of the same size was. He's got twice as many species of birds on his farmland than, than a native plant area nearby. And, and I just, I had that phrase think of, wow, he's, he's done 
better than nature here. So, so we really can. Design is at the heart of all this. How do we design better systems, more resilient systems? How do we design social systems, economic systems? We, we can do it. We have the design tools for doing all of these things. And that's my hope in this story is that, you know, one narrative that we're holding that I'm that I hold that I think is just is flat out wrong. But I believed it for a long time was that humans wreck things. Right. That's my it's a belief system. I thought, well, if you if humans move into a pristine area, it'll be wrecked. You know, the soils will be gone. The rivers will be fouled. The fish will go extinct. The amphibians are done. You know, that's just a story I have. But you, what you're saying and what I saw with my own eyes is that we can use that same clever intelligence, but in a different way. And if we do that, we can actually be uh, accelerants of uh, and enhancers of the natural process, not destroyers of, but enhancers of. That's a huge narrative flip for me. That's taking an old story and completely turning it on its head in a way that I think is, is true and it makes me feel good. So that's that's what's possible in this story. That's what I see. Right, exactly. And I, I felt the same way. Humans are a cancer on the landscape. And, and just understanding that, that we, we absolutely don't have to be. We can be the opposite. There's lots of research showing that around indigenous settlements, there's often far more bird and insect and wildlife diversity than there is out, out in the woods, out in a more, quote, natural area. So we can do the same and we can do it through design and we can do it in ways that are compatible with, with most of our, our current ways of living. Uh, and so I'm, I find those things very, very exciting. Excellent. Well, keep up the good work, and uh, thank you so much for your time today. I, I can't wait for uh, to, to gather some of the stories of people who have read it and, and uh, tried some of the things. So, um, uh, again, Toby, so great to be talking with you again, and uh, hope to do it again soon. Me too, Chris. This was very enjoyable. Thanks a lot.